We have been looking at 1 John now, and we have been looking at this assurance of salvation, something that we desperately need to see in our area and in our lives. And one thing we've seen, especially last week, was that assurance of salvation comes by the whole Christian life. It's easy to pick and choose little things. Uh, We talked about the grace of God last week. Jesus is our advocate. He speaks on our behalf, but He only speaks on behalf of those who keep His commandments and only on behalf of those who don't want to sin. In other words, He speaks on behalf of true Christians is what that means. Today though, what I want us to see, I want us to look in chapter 2, verse 2, and there was part of this verse that we only glanced at. And what I want to do today is I want to zoom in on a small portion of Scripture here, not necessarily about the assurance of salvation, but what I want us to see today is something that Free Will Baptists have always believed, and they stand in the majority tradition of church history, is that Jesus Christ has made a way for everyone to be saved. That's what I want us to see today. Look with me in verse 2 of chapter 2. We'll read the whole verse. It says this, And He Himself, that's speaking of Jesus, is the propitiation. What does propitiation mean? Again, that is the sacrifice of Jesus taking away the wrath of God or satisfying the wrath of God. Before Christ died for us, before we believed and repented, the Bible says that God is wrathful at us because we have sinned against Him. But after Christ has died, after His sacrifice is applied to the Christian's life, then God's wrath is pulled back. And you can say it this way, He smiles on His children now. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins And this is the part now I want us to focus on this morning. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. What I want us to see today is is why I believe and others believe, the majority of Christians believe, that Jesus Christ died for every man. So every man could be saved. No matter where they've gone, no matter what they've done in life, no matter how far up they think they've gone, no matter how far down they believe they've sunk, Christ has died for all men, therefore by the grace of God, all men can be saved. I want us to see that. Let me say this at the beginning. Like I said, this is the majority position. So there are other good, godly Christians who believe that Christ only died for the elect or for some. And there's godly men and women who believe that. And what we're looking at this morning is not a test of fellowship. We have fellowship with people who believe differently. In fact, the majority of people, this may surprise you, the majority of people I read after actually believe that Jesus only died for some, not all. And though I disagree with that, we have fellowship with brothers and sisters who believe that. And there there are certainly part of us. But I want us to see today why I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus has died for every person so that all people can be saved. I want us to think about this in three big parts today. The first part is this. I want us to see, and we're going to be turning to a lot of Scripture today, but I want us to see the biblical teaching, at least some of it, on the fact that Christ has made a way for every man to see. And then secondly, what I want us to see is just briefly really, I want us to try to answer two objections to that doctrine. And then thirdly, at the end today, I want us to see what that means for us. Maybe one thing that means for us. So let's start here. Back in verse 2, I want us to see the biblical teaching that Jesus has indeed made a way for every man, boy, girl, and woman to be saved. And Here's the first. I'm going to give you five lines of evidences right now for this from the Bible. Here's the first one. The first one is this. How does John in 1 John use the word world? The word world. This word world in the New Testament appears 
somewhere around 180 times in the New Testament. In 1 John alone, it appears 23 times. And in John, he uses it in different ways. And you can put it in two broad categories. The way that John uses this word world here, first of all, he can be talking about the created world. He can be talking about the material world. On the other hand, and this is the vast majority of times that he uses the word world in 1 John, he is talking about the evil world or evil people. He never uses the word to describe Christians. He never uses the word to describe only Gentiles. He either uses the word basically to describe the things of the world like money and possessions to help other people with, the the actual world that God created, this land and the trees and all, or primarily he uses the word world in 1 John, like I said, to speak of evil things. Notice what he says there about halfway through in verse 2, and not for ours only. He says Jesus did not die only for our sins. If you turn quickly to chapter 4, verse 10, we see better who the hour is here in chapter 2, verse 2. Because John uses the same language, basically, in John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Look what he says. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Who's He speaking of there? He is speaking of all Christians. He's speaking of Christian people, Jew, Gentile. He's speaking of those who have come to know God, that Jesus has died to be the propitiation, the satisfaction of the wrath of God for our sins, us. He may also be speaking about, of course, the people he's writing to. But the point is, he is speaking of Christian people. They partake of the of the sin sacrifice of Christ. But then look in chapter 2, verse 2 again. It says this, And for not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. So if John is talking about Christians at the beginning, what does he mean when he's talking about world? Let's look at a few occurrences here. Look in chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world. Now you love the trees, don't you? You love fish and you love hunting. So it's obvious here that John is not talking about just simply God's creation. But he's speaking here specifically of, we may call it this evil system of this world. Uh, You see it today on social media. You see it today on television, radio, whether it's news broadcasts about all the evils of the world, whether it's filthy videos or filthy lyrics and songs. You see this evil world, this system that is opposed to God. That's how John uses it here. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So here, obviously, John is speaking about the evil things of this world. Look in chapter 3, verse 13. Do not be surprised, brethren, he says, if the world hates you. What's the context here? Look back in verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised when evil, wicked people hate you. That's the world that Jesus died for. He died for evil, wicked people. And then look in chapter 4, verse 5. They are from where? They are from the world. Therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. Who has Jesus died for? He died for our sins, John says. But who else did Jesus die for? He died for the sinful world that all of us belong to one day. Make no mistake about it, each and every one of us was in the world one day. And then look in chapter 5, verse 5. Who is the one who overcomes the world? 
but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So what we see here is John over and over and over uses the word world in this evil negative sense. He uses the word world to show an evil system and evil people, and that's the world that Jesus died for. But if you notice back in chapter 2, verse 2, it does not say that He is the propitiation for the world. Notice what it says in verse 2. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. The two words whole world only appear together once more in John, 1 John. Look in chapter 5, verse 19, where John says this, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. How much of this world is in the power of the devil? All the world that's not Christian. And Jesus is said to have died for the whole world. Here's the second thing I want you to see about this biblical teaching. I want you to turn to Romans 5. <clears throat> Secondly, when you think about Christ making a way for everyone to be saved, I want you to think about this. In the Bible, Christ's sacrifice corresponds with the sin of Adam. And to say that another way, when Jesus obeyed God by dying for sinners, His sacrifice corresponds in a true way with the sin of Adam, specifically in the scope of Adam's sin. Look what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The Bible says because of Adam's sin, the whole human race was affected by sin. And then look down about halfway down to verse 14, about halfway through. It says of Christ, who is a type of Him who was to come. And this is brought out even more so in verse 18 of Romans chapter 5. Listen carefully to this verse. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. So when Adam sinned, all of man sinned in Adam. All of man transgressed in Adam. It affected every man. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. The scope of Adam's sin was all men. The death of Christ is the same All men. Now, of course, this is speaking about as if it was applied to all men. But we see here that the scope is the same. And Christ has died for all men. Now, this may not be revolutionary to to many of us here. I suspect uh, many of us believe this already. And yet, it's important to see these things from the Scripture. I want you to see thirdly on this biblical teaching, 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And what we see in 2 Peter chapter 2 is that there's some men that Christ has died or bought that will actually be lost one day. And that helps us see that Christ has died for all men. There's some, let me see that again. There's some people that Christ has bought or He has died for who will not be saved. You see that here in 2 Peter chapter 2. Look in verse 1. Peter is speaking of false prophets, and there's some who would argue that these false prophets were never saved. Some would argue that they had been saved. That point is not our point this morning. The point is that the false prophets here, the Bible says, Christ has bought them. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Here it is. Even denying the Master who bought them. Bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So the Bible says here that even there's some men 
that have been bought by God, they have been bought by Christ, Christ has died for them, and yet they will not be saved. Let me turn, you don't have to turn here, let me turn to Revelation 14 very quickly. We see the same word for bought, at least the same root word, is used in Revelation 14, verse 3 and 4. And it comes out in Revelation 14 as purchased. And listen to what verse 3 and 4 says. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And we could look at other references as well. But what I want you to see here, again, 2 Peter chapter 2, he's talking to false teachers, false prophets, and he says that these false prophets who will perish... They are denying the Master who bought them. Jesus has died for these people, and yet these people will be lost. Fourthly in this biblical teaching is 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to see more than one here. And of course, this is, this is a general message. We're looking at 1 John, so we're not going to dive too deeply into any other part, really, of the Bible. There's much that could be said here. Uh, and there's, there's much that could be said on the other side here. I'll just let you all know that. But what we see here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is the Bible. This is very similar to 2 Peter. The Bible tells us that Jesus is a ransom for all, is what it says here. And I want you to see that in the context of verse 5. So let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. For there is one God. Look at, this is Paul writing. Just think about the big picture that Paul's making. He says, first of all, there is one God. There's one God. For there is one God and one mediator. So you have one God, you have one mediator. He's speaking in the big picture here. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. The word men there in Greek can also be translated humanity, or all humanity, or humanity. Just the man there, you may say, is generic. It's speaking about men and women is what I'm, what I'm, one thing I'm trying to say. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. So here you have the picture is God here, and you have humanity here. That's the context of what's happening immediately before verse 6. The man Christ Jesus, and then listen to what verse 6 says who gave Himself as a ransom for all. He purchased. He he bought men. He's a, a ransom paid. Who gave Himself a ransom for all. For who? You look back in verse 5, it's speaking about humanity. Man. Christ is the mediator between God and man. Who gave Himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. So what you see here in the Bible is that Christ, it appears very clearly, has given Himself for all man. So that lost loved one you've been praying for, um, that backslider we may say, who has confessed the Lord years ago, and we may not know if he was saved or not, regardless, the people you want to see saved The people you want to see reclaimed are the people that Jesus died for. And He's made a way for them. And you see that fifthly, still in 1 Timothy chapter 2, look back in verse 4. Actually, start in verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. He says in verse 1, First of all then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men. He gets more specific, we may say, in verse 2. And then in verse 3, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. 
and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's desire, is for all men to be saved. Now, there's mystery involved in the Bible. Uh, There's things we can't fully understand. I agree to all of that. But here what we have is Christ dying and God's desire. If you notice, as it's been pointed out, in verse 1, in verse 4, in verse 6, you see this played out. God says, pray for all men. God says that He wants all men saved. And then in verse 6, Jesus has been a ransom for all men. You see that played out in this verse. Let me read a quote to you. This quote is from Charles Spurgeon. Now, you all have heard his name pretty often around here. Charles Spurgeon believed that Jesus only died for the elect. He believed that. I disagree with him on that. He believed that. He's one of the greatest preachers ever, though. But the reason I quote him is this. Listen to what he says about verse 4. And I'm jumping into his thought here. All men, say they, that is some men, as if the Holy Ghost could not have said some men, if He had meant some men. All men, say they, that is some of all sorts of men, as if the Lord could not have said all sorts of men. If he had meant that, the Holy Ghost by the Apostle has written all men and unquestionably he means all men. So he believed, even in his theological persuasion, he believed that Paul here in chapter 2 meant everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. I want you to turn to one more place on this head. Is Luke chapter 13. There's so many places we could turn to to see God's desire for men and women to be saved. But here is one of the great places. Luke 13. Verse 34. You see, and by the way, When we see God's desire for all to be saved, it at least logically follows, and and we see it in the Bible, I believe, but it logically follows if God wants all men to be saved, He would make a way for all men to be saved, right? That's how the desire of God for the salvation of all men follows and leads to God's making a way for all men. Just look here in Luke 13. This is a, a famous, one of the famous passages And we just see this real desire of God and Christ to save all people. I mean, this is... We can look at things in the Old Testament. We can look at things very similar to this in the Old Testament and other places in the New Testament. But this is Christ coming to Jerusalem. And it appears in the New Testament that Jesus comes to Jerusalem more than once and does this. But He's coming to Jerusalem here. He he is coming to them not simply as a man who has lived on earth for 30 years or so, but He is coming to them, yes, as a man, but He's coming to them as the God-man. And He is thinking of Jerusalem from all the history of the Jews and their rejection of God over and over and over. In Psalm 81, how God says, if only my people would listen to me, I would subdue their enemies. If they would just listen to me and do what I say, I would subdue their enemies. He's coming to them after they rejected Moses, after they had sinned, and even the kings like David had sinned, and even some prophets. There's a prophet in the Old Testament who at least one time in his life turns away from the commandment of God and God kills the man. He's coming to His people in the history of redemption. And this is what he says in verse 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. Just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. That's the desire of God. To come to gather the people together like a mother hen does to her 
chicks to come and embrace the people, to come and protect them. And in another passage in the Gospel, it says that Jesus came to Jerusalem and wept over the city. What does that tell us? It tells us about the real desire for God to see men and women saved and come to know Him. So those are five lines of evidences that we see. I want you to turn to Ephesians 2 now. Secondly, I want, to, I want to try to answer two objections. Two objections to this doctrine that Christ has died so all men could be saved. The first objection is this. We can find the answer to it, at least in part, in Ephesians 2. But it goes something like this. And maybe some of you have heard this or, or, or someone has said this to you and you didn't know what to say about it. One of the objections to Christ dying so all could be saved, is that if, in fact, Jesus has died for all men, then how could anybody be lost? Have you all ever thought of that before? It's a, it's a real question. It's a, it has to be answered, too. If Jesus has died for all men, then how? If, 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 if we may say, if, if God has laid the sin of all men on Jesus, then, then how can any man be lost? Isn't there sin paid for? Mustn't it be that Christ only died for the elect because they're the only ones saved? Mustn't that be the case? And what I want us to see in part here in Ephesians 2 is that the death of Christ is only truly applied to people once they come to Christ and once they believe and repent. You see that in Ephesians 2, verse 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing, of course. And what does Paul say? Among them we too all formally live. Now, he includes himself into this. He says, among them... Let's just go back in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them we too. Paul says we were all like that. Every one of us, we were like that. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and here it is, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now what point do I make here? This is the point. The propitiation that Christ offered on the cross removes the wrath of God, and here the Apostle Paul says we were by nature children of wrath. We were under wrath, even though Christ has died for us. The sacrifice of Christ is only given and applied in a true sense when someone believes and repents. Then I want you to turn to Ephesians 5. The second objection I would say to this doctrine that Christ has made a way for all men and women, boys and girls to be saved is that some will say that, but in the Bible, the Bible says that Christ only died for the church. That Christ only died for certain people. The Bible says that. And you, and you do see that in the Bible. And it's, it's very significant as well, by the way. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. So here you have someone comes to you and they say, But the Bible says that Jesus only died for the church. He gave Himself up for the church or for saints or for His people, which is very true. Very true. You see that here, the second half of verse 25 again. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. And the argument is something like this. If Christ has only died for the church, that doesn't, that means He has not died for everyone else who's not in the church. Here's what I want us to see today. I want you to turn to Galatians 2. What I want us to see in Galatians 2 is that just because the Bible speaks specifically of Christ dying for people or groups does not necessarily limit that 
to only dying for them. Let me give an illustration. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me, Paul says. Paul says that Jesus died for me. Of course, that doesn't mean He only died for Paul, does it? He died for Paul. Paul says it. He died for me. But then Paul says in Ephesians 5, He also died for the church. And then we would read a passage like John 1, verse 29, where John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then we read John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And then we look at maybe some of the passages we've looked at already. Jesus is a ransom for all. Jesus has bought those who will perish. And we say, yes, amen, Christ has died for His church, but He also died for Paul, and He also died for the world, and we believe He died for all people. And then thirdly, this morning, what I want us to see, and we've already seen it in some sense, I just want us to see what this means for us today. It means a lot of things. What does this mean for us today as people? Does it really change anything? And what I want you to see and to feel and to understand is when we see that Christ not only reaches out His hand, so to speak, to all people, but has made Himself a sacrifice for all people, we see very clearly that God wants all people saved. There's a true story about a woman. She was a very poor woman. She lived in a very poor area, but she had this beautiful daughter, a beautiful daughter. She was young, and this poor woman was just afraid for her daughter's life because this little girl was beautiful. You remember what it says about Moses, that his parents saw that he was a beautiful child. Well, this mother, this poor woman who lived in a different country, she saw that this beautiful daughter of hers... Wow, she is just so pretty, and she was concerned for that. Have you ever been concerned about the beauty of your children? That may sound strange. The reality is this. Beauty can get people into a lot of trouble sometimes. Beauty can lead to a lot of temptations. We, You all know all about that, don't you? It can. I mean, that's a reality for parents and grandparents, honestly. Beauty can lead to a lot of problems. doesn't have to. God uses beautiful people. God used Esther for this reason. God put Esther here as queen. Basically, Esther won a beauty contest. That's why she became queen. And God used her mightily to save her people because she was beautiful. But beauty comes with risks. And this poor woman saw that her daughter was so beautiful and she just worried that one day, she thought one day, (coughs) I'm afraid my daughter's going to grow up and go off to the big city and that's exactly what happened. One day the, the woman came home, the mother came home, she found a note in the house and she saw the note and her beautiful daughter had grown up and went to the big city to find a life for herself. You know what that mother did? That mother took the money she had. She took a a, a photo of herself, not her daughter, of herself. She went and made copies of the photo of herself, the mother. Made copies of that. She went to this large city. She put her picture up in all types of different places. You say, what is going on here? She put the mother herself, the mother put her picture up in all these different places, probably bars, hotels, etc. All this large city was covered with pictures of this mother. And it came about that one day, the daughter was walking down the stairs in a hotel with a man. She had become a prostitute. And it was told that she... She looked at herself in the mirror. She was looking at herself, seeing how much she had aged through this way of life. 
And she saw that picture of her mother. She said, what's my mother doing here? And she takes that picture and she turns it on the back. And the back says, no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've done, come home. And that's what God says to the world. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how deep in sin you've gone, no matter how much you've disappointed people, no matter how much secret sin you have in your life, no matter how much unbelief you have in your life, no matter how far you've come to Me, My Son has died, come back to Me. I want you saved. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want the wicked to repent and be saved and come to Me. God came and gave His Son to save saved sinners. That's what we were. And God came and changed us and saved us. When you look at this doctrine of God's desire for the salvation of the world, of God giving His Son for the world, what we see so plainly is, if we will, and I say this reverently, pictures of God everywhere in this world saying, come home. Come home. You may be here and you have a family member, you have a friend, you have someone you're deeply concerned about and you want to see them saved. We'll pray for their salvation knowing that Christ has given His life for them. Or you may be here this morning and you're not a Christian or there's sin in your life and you know there's sin in your life. Listen. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. However, we must come to Him and receive that forgiveness and receive that cleansing that only Christ offers. May God bless us this morning. May God bless us in the truth that Christ has made a way for every man to be saved and to be forgiven.